Hello and welcome to today's palming party. We're having a little bit of a special Halloween edition today. I did make a little mistake um, with scheduling this originally. Um, so I sent out a link yesterday to, to a bunch of you, which probably isn't working right now. So I am just going to give a few minutes before we jump into the palming together, just to let people find us here. I did just send out an updated email with the correct link. So uh, appreciate those of you here with me already. Um, I'm pretty excited about today's palming party because I wanted to guide you through an interesting visualization that we're going to spend about 20 or 30 minutes palming. So this is designed to be kind of a longer extended palming session. Sometimes we just don't really give ourselves these times or opportunities to really go deep into it. So I'm going to give you some opportunities to really um, not only relax your eyes today, but a big purpose of these palming parties is to help you go deeper into learning about your imagination, your memory, and your visualization. So we're going to be playing with mental pictures today. I'm also going to be sticking around after we finish palming and just doing some Q&A or discussions, whether it's about today's topic, about some of the visualizations we try, or anything about natural vision improvement in general. So not uh, I'm just recycling one of my old Halloween costumes today with my uh, giraffe ears, um, so I don't have the full getup, but for the most part, we're going to have our eyes closed anyway. But i uh, seeing some more people joining us, so um, might as well just jump right into it. Um, we're really just going to be focusing in on one practice today, our palming practice. So hopefully many of you have already experienced this or at least, you know, have tried it out to an extent. Um, I do have a separate video on YouTube that kind of goes through the instructions of it, but I will guide you into it right now. What's really important is that you have some support. Um, I don't want you to be slouching over for 20 or 30 minutes. I want you to be sitting up upright, up comfortably, and with our palms covering our eyes, it keeps our elbows up, our, our elbows are lifted. So we want to have something to rest them on so that we can really fully relax and sink into this. So I am going to look for my palming stick, if I can find it. It's still getting everything situated with my new office space here. So I may have to actually use my palming pillow instead, or I may just lean forward onto my desk because I have a desk that has a, a higher level where I can actually rest my elbows and be pretty comfortably seated. I'm actually going to lower my chair a little bit because then that makes the surface even higher. So now it's almost more of like a 90 degree angle with my my elbows here. And I'm just gonna rearrange my desk a little bit so that my voice still comes through. All right. All right, and a couple people are already typing into the comments about letting me know how they're setting up, putting, uh, Gia's putting their elbows on a wooden table. It's always a good one. Oh, Pierre is also wearing some bunny ears for the palming. Awesome. Hopefully they won't get in the way. Great. So whether you get some uh, pillows, some people stack some books on their desk um, to provide some more height. We Once again, ultimately, we just don't want to be kind of like, you know, slouching down with our neck or our shoulders. We want to be able to be nice and upright. So whatever's comfortable for you. And really, we're, we're going to be blocking the light. We're not really pushing on the eyes at all. So there should be no pressure onto your, usually your eyes are closed. You shouldn't be touching the eyelids. You should have your palms cupped so that there's some space so your eyes can move around and maybe even blink if your eyes are going to be open or closed. So that's pretty much about it. You just want to make sure you're not constricting your breathing. You're not constricting your posture. And keep in mind, we are going to hold the palming position for a longer time today, but I'm probably going to guide you through a couple little breaks where you keep your eyes closed, but maybe you take one hand off and you kind of open and close your fists or maybe reach it up, kind of um, do some shoulder rolls and then switch and do the other side. 
or you might want to take both hands down and, and just kind of move in some way. When you do take these breaks, I do recommend that you keep the eyes closed so that you can kind of maintain the darkness and connection with the inner vision. I'm also going to silence my cell phone so we don't get interrupted halfway through. All right. So without further ado, I would love to uh, for us all to kind of come into our relaxation position of palming. I'm just going to drink some water before we go in. And some people like to rub their hands together first, just to create some heat or some friction. So I'm just waiting until I feel the warmth right in the middle of my hands. And then I'm just gonna cup them. And I like to lay the fingers of one hand over the other, over my forehead. So it kind of creates an upside down V shape. This leaves plenty of room for my nose to breathe. And my eyelids are not constricted. So my eyes are open right now and my eyes are closed right now. I can blink my eyes, I can look around in a circle. And I actually like to do a circle first with my eyes open just to see if there's any light leaking in. And if so, I'm just gonna reposition my hands to do my best to seal, seal myself off from all the light. Everyone's hands are different sizes. Everyone's bone structure is a little different. Some people are able to get a 100% seal but not everybody is. So even if there's not a way to get that complete darkness, that's okay. Just go ahead and close your eyes. Some people ask like, well, can I just wear a blindfold or a sleep mask or something like that? And it can be a nice alternative, but this is not a sleep mask party or a blindfold party. This is a palming party. So there's something special and different about achieving this darkness with your hands versus with some external tool that's not a part of yourself. Palming is taught by the Bates Method, a practice found in the Bates Method, and the Bates Method is a self-healing process. It's a self-healing practice. So by putting your own hands over your own eyes, you are creating a little bit more of this self-healing dynamic versus just putting on a blindfold. It can definitely be relaxing and a nice supportive tool, but it's never going to replace this wonderful palming practice. And I do recognize that there may be some people joining us as, you know, once we've already gotten started kind of in the middle. So every once in a while, I'll just be kind of inviting any newcomers to say, hey, come on and join us and palm your eyes. Just do exactly what I'm doing. Find a nice, comfortable position. Get your elbows supported, your shoulders relaxed. Lock out all that light. And join us for this visualization. We are about to begin a guided visualization together because after palming for just a few minutes already, hopefully some of the extraneous thoughts and images and maybe even light perceptions or colors or shapes, they might start to kind of fade a little bit or kind of calm down or settle down. Sometimes it takes several minutes for the mind to really get to the point where it's ready to even begin visualizing. So, Stay connected with your breath. Remind yourself that this is a relaxing experience. And I'd like to guide us through a visualization that has to do with a house. This visualization is uh, meant to be done with your childhood home. I'm going to be visiting my childhood home in this visualization and kind of narrating the different 
areas that we explore. And you've got some options. You can either come with me to my childhood home and kind of use your imagination of what it might like, look like. But you might want to actually go ahead and do this with your childhood home because I want you to connect in with your own memories. The full spectrum of memories. So I'm going to begin by imagining the home that I have the most memories in growing up the house that I moved to when I was about five years old and lived in until the age of 18. So about 12 or 13 years spent in this home. It is pretty easy for me to remember what it looks like because of all that time I spent there. Now, I did live in a house before that, but I don't have a ton of memories before the age of five. So I want you to pick, you know, a particular time in your life where you kind of want to hone in in. So whatever house or apartment or flat or building, you know, whatever, whatever version this is for you, there's got to be an entrance somewhere. <laughs> there's got to be a way to get into this house. So I am approaching the front door and we're all going to go ahead and enter through the doorway of the home that we're visualizing. And the really cool thing about this is I'm going to be sharing my experience, but everybody here right now and everybody listening is going to have their own unique version of this. That's what I get really excited about this whole vision improvement process is from the outside, it looks like we're all doing the same exact thing. We're just covering our eyes with our palms. So if we were actually all together in a room, everyone, you know, someone seeing us from the outside would be like, oh, wow, they're all doing the same exact thing. But that's because they can't read our minds and they can't realize that every single person is in the same position, but thinking of or imagining or visualizing something completely unique. So there's no right or wrong here. I want you to really not try too hard to force any imagery to appear. Visualization only really works when you're relaxed. So that's what the palming is for. The palms are here to keep us relaxed as we begin this visualization, entering this doorway to our childhood home and taking a look around. What's in the entryway? What's the layout of this house? What kind of building materials make up this house? So just to give you, a, I'm not gonna go too deep into it because I want this to be your experience. So I do wanna leave just some space for you to explore, but just to guide us along Right when you go through my front door, there's a staircase. And to the left and to the right is our family room. So that's where I'm going to go first. Once we enter the house, we're going to explore room by room. So as I step into the family room, I'm just taking a, a stock of the room. There's a sofa and there's a coffee table. There's a lazy boy chair and there's a television and there's some art on the walls and some house plants and framed pictures on the windowsills. And when I'm in this room, I'm just allowing any memories to come through. What kind of memories do you have in this first room of your house? And like I said at the beginning, it's the full spectrum of memories. Whenever we live in a place for so long, there's going to be all kinds of memories, good memories, bad memories, neutral memories. And we're just here to feel it and to observe.
And this, uh, the entry, the entryway was a wooden floor, but this is carpeted. So I'm also bringing my other senses into this visualization. So what does the carpet feel like on my feet compared to the hardwood floor? And, you know, rooms change over the years, right? So 13 years of living in this house, it had some different furniture or different layouts. So you might be remembering different phases of the setup of the rooms or the decorations and things like that. But I'm not just interested in the sense of touch. What about the sense of hearing? And I remember in this room, I played a lot of video games with some of my friends and family. So I'm now starting to kind of imagine hearing maybe some of the sound effects from those video games or some of the theme songs. But right next to this family room is a dining room. So I'm going to move into the dining room, which has a table and, and chairs around it. And there's a china cabinet. And this room wasn't used a whole lot, just for some big, you know, family gatherings or holiday meals and special occasions. So now I'm kind of putting myself at the table, sitting there, imagining who's sitting around me at the other chairs, aunts and uncles. This room also carpeted, so feeling that sensation on my bare feet. And right next to the dining room is a kitchen, so I'm going to make my way into the kitchen now. So once again, if, if you're just joining, we are palming and visualizing and having an experience of exploring a home that we lived in, whether it's the home we live in now, or ideally we can do a childhood home, something that maybe we haven't thought about in a while. We're stimulating and activating some parts in our brains, our memories. This is a big part of the Bates method. Vision improvement process is not just doing practices with your eyes and doing vision work, but also working with your memory. So I'm remembering the kitchen in my childhood home and the layout of it, you know, where the counters were and the cabinets and the refrigerator and the sink, and the dishwasher. And we had an island in the center of the kitchen. And generally when I would come home from school, I would reach into the fridge and get a Coke and then go into the island and get the tasty cake, which you would only get that reference if you from Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I would take that into the den, which is on the other side of the kitchen, which had a, another sofa in it and a, a TV. So I would generally watch some TV in there. We also had a fireplace and a mantle in there. So I have a lot of memories of first, it was a wood burning fireplace. And then it we got a gas range installed, so it was a gas fireplace. But either way, I remember sitting there by the flames. Um, and, and this is coming from many different phases of my time in that house. And can you remember the art on the walls of your childhood home? Any pictures? I remember in this room, we had a big photograph of Ansel Adams that Ansel Adams took, the photographer, on one wall in a painting or a picture of Pebble Beach, a golf course in California on the other wall. And off of this room, there was a little deck or a porch where we're not going to go out there yet. We've got some more things to explore inside, but 
there's a few more things on this floor. There's a, our washer and dryer and a bathroom and the door out to the garage. But for now, we're going to go ahead and go upstairs. Did the house that you're picturing, the house that you grew up, did it have more than one story? Did it have any stairs going up to another floor? And if so, you can go up there. When you went up the stairs in my home, it led to the bedrooms. Right at the top of the stairs, you face my room and my sister's room. And you can probably tell the difference because my door was just covered in stickers from different skateboard companies and punk bands and all kinds of crazy colors and shapes and stickers all over my door, whereas my sister's door just had one big Britney Spears poster on it. So I'm going to go into my room first, which is where I spent the most time. And it also kind of had my, my, you know, customization to it. You know, I, I kind of set it up how I wanted it and decorated it the way I wanted. So I'm inviting you to go to your childhood bedroom and look around and just see the arrangement where where's your bed are there any shelves or books or did you have a desk or a table or any toys in there any games is there anything on the walls was there a window in your room and if so, did you look out it and what did you see out, out that window? Maybe there was a, a closet or somewhere where you kept your clothes. What kind of clothes did you wear back then? What kind of shoes did you have? These are just memories that we are tapping into and some might come through, some might not. We're just creating some space for it. Now this is optional and this is a little bit different than what we're doing in this visualization, but while we're here, I'll just mention it very briefly. Sometimes it can be powerful to, you know, while exploring your childhood bedroom, actually picture that version of yourself in your room, maybe sitting on a chair or sitting on the bed. And you're there in, in the present moment, the present version of yourself, knowing what you know now and having learned what you've learned up to this point in your life the perspective that you've gotten over the, over the years. And it can sometimes be nice to actually have a little chat with your inner child, your younger version of yourself. And maybe there are some things that you would like to tell them. Or maybe there are some questions you want to ask, or maybe, maybe your inner child wants to tell you some things or ask you some things and, can be a pretty pretty healing experience to spend some time doing some of that inner child work so that's up to you you know how far you want to go in that direction but I do want to recognize that at this point we have been palming for a good chunk of time and before we continue exploring this mental house that we're picturing this might be a good time to take our first little stretch break where I'm going to keep both my eyes closed, but I'm going to remove one palm from my face and I'm going to start to open and close my fist. So I make a fist and then I open, open it up, stretch the fingers out, and then I'll do some wrist rolls. So I'm just doing some circles with my wrist and then I'm reaching up towards the ceiling as if I was trying to reach something very tall. And then I'm just letting my arm reach down towards the floor. Now, giving it a little shake. 
and it's ready to go back and cover that eye. And I'll do the same thing with the other hand. So keeping both eyes still closed, opening and closing the fist, doing some wrist rolls in either direction, reaching up towards the sky, and then letting your arm float down towards the floor. You can either give it a shake down there or bring it back up and give it a shake. And I'm gonna get back in to palming. So now it's nice and dark again. And I'm just giving myself a moment to let any of the light that I just perceived through my closed eyelids fade away. I want it to start to get darker and darker. And now I'm going to leave my childhood bedroom. For anyone just joining, we're palming our eyes and visualizing our childhood home. And I'm giving a little narration about mine, but ultimately I want you to be using your home and your memories. But to sort of continue the tour, I'm going to leave my childhood bedroom and poke my head into my sister's childhood bedroom and just look around and see where her bed was and her desk and where the window was on the wall and any decorations she had put up. So did you have any siblings, any sisters or brothers or anyone that you shared spaces with growing up? Because we each had our own room, but next to them, we had our, our bathroom that we shared. And uh, across the hall, there was also a guest room with a, a guest bed, a day bed in it, and a desk and a computer. So I spent a lot of time in there, either on the computer or sometimes if I would have a sleepover, a friend over, we would, we would actually like do the day bed. It was like a two bed thing that would come out. And the only other room upstairs was my parents' room, the master bedroom down the hall. So if I were to go in there, I might see their big bed and they also had a desk in there with a computer as well as a bathroom and a closet and their bathroom with the shower and bathtub and really big plant in there. So having, having explored the upper floor of the house, well, did your house have an attic? There might even be a floor above this. So I don't have a ton of memories of that, but I'm pretty sure we did. So if you did, or if you spent any time up in your attic, you could also poke your head up there and kind of look around and see the layout, you know, what, what's collecting dust up there and there's maybe some storage things or crawl spaces. All we're doing is just exploring this, the memory of this home, what we remember, what we don't. But I'm going to make my way downstairs again because we also had a basement and I come back down the, the upper stairs and I make my way down the basement stairs. And we had an unfinished basement, so it was concrete floors. But there were some rugs and things, but this was where I spent a lot of time with neighborhood friends playing games. And we even had a ping pong table down there. So we would have some tournaments But the basement was so interesting because it's, it's where we would have a lot of our imagination-based games as kids. We would come up with all these different worlds and made up games with these imaginary rules. And, 
And it was just this place that fostered a lot of creativity. You know, we had some little toys down there that we would play with and things, but I just remember that, you know, even though it was just a concrete basement, it, it had this kind of magical feeling to it because of this creativity and this imagination and, we would build forts down there and, and create these different worlds. And and that's part of what we, we can do when we palm our eyes, even as adults, you know, we're in this kind of dark cave of our hands right now. We're creating this nice dark space for us to maybe imagine things or come up with, creative ideas or playful images and things. But it wasn't all good memories in the basement. Um, there were some scary ones too, because a lot of times I was the last one in the basement and I had to turn all the lights off. And we didn't have lights on a switch. They had a string that you had to pull the string down to turn the light off. And there was kind of a far corner of the basement where there weren't any windows. And usually I was down there at night. And so, okay, it's time to go back upstairs. There's three strings that I have to pull. The first one is the farthest one in that deepest, darkest corner. Then the second one is a little bit closer to the door. But the third one, there was still a lot of space between pulling the string and then getting to the, the bottom of the basement steps. So I just have these memories of turning all the lights off and running as fast as I could for fear that something was chasing me or something was going to get me. And I would just bolt up the basement stairs every single time. So, you know, with it being Halloween today and, and just kind of this holiday sort of celebrating, you know, spooky things or, or scary things. And I just wanted to recognize that a lot of times when we palm, we hear about these instructions to think of a pleasant, happy memory, you know, picture a nice soothing scene at the beach or, you know, picture a waterfall or some, you know, something that's just all good. But there might actually be some merit in, in tapping into, you know, some of the, like the full spectrum of feeling, the full spectrum of emotion, even if it's a little scary. Because I was afraid of the dark. And I realized as I was improving my vision with the Bates method that it wasn't just about doing eye exercises, it's about overcoming fears as well. But I would say that the positive memories outweigh those, those few uh, bad ones and scary ones down there. But I'm going to go ahead and leave the basement without running. <laughs> and we're going to go outside. So not only do you want to remember the interior of your childhood home, but I'm sure you have some memories on the exterior. What was the outside of the house like? Was there any kind of backyard or garden or little area for some outdoor space? You know, what street was this home on? Was it in a busy city block? Was it down at the end of a long wooded driveway, sit in the suburbs. So I'm picturing playing with some neighborhood friends out on the street, whether we're riding our bikes or our skateboards or our rollerblades. Sometimes we would play hockey. Other times we would just go play in the woods and we would either climb trees or build little forts or explore caves or 
once again, just kind of come up with some games to play. So I'm going to leave a minute or two of silent palming to finish up with. And this is just going to be for you to do whatever you want, whether it's going back into the house or staying outside and, and tapping into some memories from outdoor time at that childhood home. Without any guidance or direction, I'm just going to let you go where you want to go. And then you'll hear my voice shortly to conclude our visualization. So now you get to have fun on your own for a few moments. Just remember to breathe, keep your hands relaxed, your shoulders relaxed. Okay, so we are going to begin to bring our visualization to a close. We are going to slowly begin to take our hands down, peeling them away from the face, keeping the eyes closed to allow for a gradual readjustment to the light after being in the dark for quite some time your pupils have likely dilated and you want to let them constrict back down before you open your eyes back up and if you start to blink your eyes back open you can get a sense is it okay is it adjusted or do you need to close again for a few more seconds and maybe sort of like if you were sunning your eyes, having your eyes closed and facing towards maybe a window or a light bulb in the room, just to help your visual system continue to readjust. So it's always up to you and your comfort level of when you want to open back up and come back into your physical eyesight after being in your inner vision for, for so long. And sometimes after being in your inner vision for an extended period of time like that, and you open your eyes back up, you may actually experience a change. Sometimes it is a physical change where your eyesight literally looks a little bit different. Um, and that can go either way. 
sometimes people come out of palming and they're still adjusting to the light and it's, it might be a little blurry. Other times people come out and things are actually looking sharper, more colorful, more defined, maybe even some, some more clarity in the eyesight, which is one of the purposes of why we palm our eyes in the first place is it's a very important self-care practice for yourself. And we just did it for about 30 minutes. So that is what I would call a half marathon of palming whereas a full marathon might be 60 minutes. So you could, if you want, you could keep on palming as I go through and read some of the comments and do some Q&A discussion. Um, if you do want to actually go ahead and continue to expand the benefits, um, I do want to just say that maybe the half an hour or the hour long palming session, maybe you only do it once a month or a couple times a month, whereas your more average palming lengths on a daily basis might actually be shorter, maybe just 30 seconds or a minute at a time. And it still counts. You still get benefits from doing these tiny little palming breaks. So one of my, my hopes and dreams for everyone here in the palming party is that this is just something that you literally do every day, even if it's just for a moment. But if you if you cover your eyes with your palms every day, it really leads you down a different path with your eye health in the long run. And it's so simple. And it's just a matter of getting yourself set up with a nice, comfortable position. So I would love to hear any feedback. Any Anybody here, if you want to type into the, uh, the live chat, you can uh, do so. That'll pop up on my end. And I'm just going to... Uh, stick around probably till the top of the hour um, and just see if there's any questions, any experiences, any feedback from today's palming party, or if anybody wants to share their, uh, their Halloween costume, let us know what you're dressed up as today. Cool. So nice. Hey, DN, glad you could be here today. It's nice to see you. Uh, she says, I love palming in between tasks or while a website is loading. The short sessions add up in the long term. I love that because I, I remembered that there were many times when I would be watching that little beach ball spinning or, you know, a loading bar slowly climbing and it's like loading or buffering something. And I would just stare at it with my eyes open. You know, I'd be like, come on, come on, come on. Instead, like Duyen is saying, you can either close your eyes or palm your eyes. And then you're actually, you know, charging your own eyes and your vision up while your page is loading. Uh, so that's a really, really good example of how this stuff can be squeezed in to times during your day that you might not be utilizing. Because that's a common sort of challenge or complaint that people have is that, I just don't have a lot of free time to do this stuff. You know, I'm busy, right? So if, if we can find these little slivers, um, and in a class I was teaching earlier this month, I was also talking about that, you know, um, the bathroom is a great time to palm as well. So if you're sitting on the toilet, <laughs> your, your legs are right there. You could either stare at your phone while you do it, or you could palm your eyes and, you know, once again, it's just finding these creative times to, to fit more, to fit more in. Hello, Rantone saying, uh, happy Halloween from Seattle. Glad you could tune in from the West coast. Uh, Bethany said, I'm doing acupuncture treatment for my eyes and my acupuncturist has given me the same exercise and some others. I had a lot of nerve pain near my eyes so much better now. That's really great. Yeah, definitely things like acupuncture, yoga, different different healing modalities can really complement the Bates techniques and the Bates work, the vision work. So yeah, my vision teacher said that all vision problems are nervous problems. So if you already feel like you have this kind of nerve pain or this you know nervous system issue, Bates method can really, really target that. Catherine said, I've had cataract surgery in my right eye. Will palming help my left eye? Yeah, it's going to help both eyes. Even if you've had a surgery, 
because uh, the cataract surgery is just um, working with the lens inside the eye. So that's just one part of the eye. When you palm, you are relaxing not only that part, but the extraocular muscles around the eyes, the involuntary muscles in your iris that dilate and constrict your pupils. It's kind of working with your optic nerves as well, because um, they're usually overly stimulated all, all the time with the light. So when we block out all the light, our optic nerves get a rest. So it's, it's benefiting your brain. I mean, it's, it's so much more than just your eyes. So yes, I would definitely, definitely recommend doing that. And you could also just do one eye palming as well. So let's say this, this, uh, issue of not having much time. And like, let's say you want to, I don't know, watch a show or, you know, do read an article or something. You could always just palm your left eye and then keep using your right eye or palm your right eye and keep using your left eye. So that's another way you can kind of play with it and be efficient with it. All right, a couple more things came in there. So let me find where I left off. Well, hey Reese, glad you're here. I feel like what works best for me is combining oppositional movement and peripheral vision uh, and central fixation at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and agree with you on that one. That I think um, that's actually pretty close to my personal definition of what perfect vision is, is a really nice balance or combination of having a really wide peripheral awareness. And like you pointed out, it's primarily about sensing movement. It's kind of funny, right when I said that, this flock of birds flew in the sky out my window. So my central vision is looking at the camera, but my peripheral vision is seeing the birds flying. So perfect vision is having that uh, simultaneous peripheral awareness of the movement and specifically the oppositional movement, while at the same time having your central fixation in the middle. So yeah, I think you're spot on with that and that's a really good thing to practice. Hey Sonny, thanks for being here. All right, and I think Bethany, you had a question. Wait, no. I, so up at the top, I'm scrolling up, and um, Bilgi typed in. If you have time, could you please address uh, Dr. Amy's breathing technique, as it contradicted your earlier video about breathing? I'm kind of confused about breathing techniques. So yeah, I have a video that's all about breathing, and it's about sort of the Bates method and and using the breath to relax your eyes. And I go through a couple different uh, breathing techniques, most of which are inspired by yoga. So yoga has these pranayamas that have specific instructions, whether it's the ujjayi breath or the alternate nostril breathing or the breath of fire, <laughs> you know, the, or uh, yeah, there's a, a, a handful of different yogic breathing techniques. Recently, I interviewed uh, someone on my podcast, the Naked Eye podcast, Dr. Amy Novotny, and she has developed a, a, a unique breathing technique called PABR. It's the PABR method, stands for pain, awareness, breathing, relief, breath relief. So yes, it is a little bit different than the way that I, I taught it in my video. And that's kind of why I wanted to highlight her as a way to continue to give you some different takes on this because there's really no just like one right answer with all this stuff. Everybody's so different that you might try one thing and it doesn't work. And then you try a different version and, and you get this much different re response to it. Same thing with palming. Some people palming just doesn't work for them. It doesn't bring them into that relaxed place. And so this is not a cookie cutter approach. Um, and I really like to provide people with a buffet of options to choose from since I know that it's a very individualized process. So I would say to you that um, I would experiment with the different versions and see what actually feels best for you as an individual, whether it's the way that Dr. Amy teaches it or the way that yoga teaches it or, you know, Wim Hof has his whole breathing thing. So everybody's, you know, it's, it's all the breath, right? So I think it's, it's all good to explore. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And Bethany was asking about Dr. Bates's book. So I was just giving my definition of what I think perfect vision is. 
because the name of Dr. Bates's book is Perfect Sight Without Glasses. And it kind of um, struck me how long it took me to even start to ask myself, like, well, what does perfect vision really mean? But anyway, that book is available. You can either get it for free online in like a PDF form, or if you want the actual paperback version of it, it's kind of hard to find the, the original one from 1920, the perfect sight without glasses, but there is an updated or kind of edited version called better sight without glasses. So for the most part, it's the same materials, but it is a little shortened and there are some things that have been either removed or modified. So I'm pretty sure the original one is the one that's online for free. Um, and I can actually type that link into the chat. So David Kiesling runs a blog called I Blindness. And on there, there is the ebook version of Dr. Bates's book. And so if you want to get like the original version, I would go there. Otherwise, if you want the Better Eyesight uh, paperback, you can find that online pretty easily. And there is a link to that book um, through my website. So I'll put that in the chat as well. Because I do think it is a good idea to go straight to the source and really learn, you know, like Bates really explains the palming practice in that book and really all the benefits and how, you know, what it's actually doing. And, um, you know, I have that in my book as well, but I, th I think it's smart to really just go right to the original ophthalmologist who developed this stuff a hundred years ago. So, yeah, I am kind of curious to hear if anybody has any, um, you know, specific things about any imagery they were experiencing, any memories that were popping up from this kind of childhood home thing. Cause it's um, sometimes some interesting feelings can come through, whether it's just nostalgia or, or other things. So, Hey, Harriet, glad you're here. Uh, she said earlier, rubbing hands is supposed to be good for brain balancing. So your eyes are extensions of your brain and we've got a left brain and a right brain. Or, and so uh, a part of the vision practice does involve this whole, you know, brain hemisphere coordination and integration thing. So uh, that's a good connection there about, you know, kind of rubbing the left and the right sides together, right in the middle there. Um, so thank you for that tip, Harriet. Appreciate that. Appreciate you staying up for us, staying up with us too, GF. Uh, so it's midnight. So we're getting a nice little late night palming session in. Oh, cool. Reese is uh, just typing in their, their experience. I had plus 3.50 hyperopia in my left eye, and now I have perfect vision thanks to relaxation and Bates method practices. Wow. That's, yeah, really, really, really great to hear. And just seeing the, the tangible, you know, vision improving, the numbers changing, not needing the glasses. I mean, that's that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I like how you've really attributed it to the relaxation because that's really what, where the magic is. Uh, Glenda's got a good idea there. Wish you would start a palming club to do this every Sunday as a group. There's power there. I do agree that it, it's, it's powerful enough to do the palming by yourself, but when we do it like this all together, um, even though we are maybe at a distance and we're not in the same space, it can really, I think, amplify the, uh, the benefits. And I know for me, it, it sort of like helps hold me more accountable as well. Um, uh, cause sometimes if you're just by yourself, it might be easier to easy to just kind of stop early and start looking at your phone again. So, <laughs> so yeah, there, there's a chance, uh, we might get something more regularly cause yeah, these, this is only the third palming party I've done and there's been big gaps of time in between, um, just cause I'm busy, you know, teaching lessons and classes and courses and stuff, but um, uh, yeah, this, I could definitely see this being a little bit more of a regular thing because I, I know I like it and I benefit from it as well. So, all right. And Glenda was also asking, um, if anyone over 60 who's had LASIK experienced changes from all the exercises, uh, I, I can share that 
you know, a fair amount of people that I work with have had laser eye surgery and, and they've noticed that it worked well up to a point and then they started needing glasses again. And instead of doing another um, surgery, they just would try the Bates approach instead. And a lot of them do get pretty good results. And kind of like the earlier cataract surgery question, the LASIK also is just addressing one little part of the eye, the, the cornea. And so the Bates method takes all the other parts of not only the eye, but the whole visual system into account. So there still is a lot of room for, for change to come through. All right. So I think I'm caught up down to where I left off. Let's see. Here's the cataract question. Finding here. Um, someone asked how much time to see better. So that's a good question in terms of just like, how long do I have to palm or how often do I have to do this stuff to, to see the results? And, and I, I like for people to like experience very short term temporary changes. So even just after today's palming party, you may have already noticed a little change in your vision, even if it didn't last. So if it's not permanent, it's temporary. You, you come out of palming and you're like, whoa, my vision seems a little better. And then within a few moments, it might kind of go back to what it was before and it might seem kind of blurry again. And that, those are the initial temporary improvements that you can get like today. You can even get improved vision today by doing what we did. Uh, maybe you've already had some improvement today, but it's a matter of doing that regularly enough so that it does become more long lasting and permanent. So generally I like to say that the temporary changes take days to weeks, but the permanent improvements of seeing better all the time can sometimes take longer, sometimes months to years. You don't have to palm your eyes for an hour a day, you know, that whole time, but it, and palming isn't the only practice. There's other things you can be doing as well, but it is about this kind of long-term dedication to it and consistency um, just like you would, if you were to ask yourself, like, okay, I want to learn how to play guitar, right? So how much time does it take to be able to become a good guitar player? I mean, that can take years. You know, I, I started playing guitar when I was 10 years old. So if, if vision's a little different because we, we depend on it so much, I, I don't depend on playing the guitar, you know, to perform my everyday tasks. So it is a different ball game. But I do want you to think about your eyes like you would think about an instrument or learning a language or something that takes time and you got to be patient with it and you got to keep practicing. Sonny asked if palming uh, helps with floaters too. It's a good question because um, when you palm your eyes, uh, hopefully you felt this, you generate a lot of heat and heat generally has this kind of vasodilation effect. So it opens up the channels to um, not only the blood flow, but the lymph flow, as well as the fluid exchange inside your eye. Because there's, there's these drainage canals where fluids, ex they drain out and new fluid comes in. And so with my floaters, I always thought about, okay, I want to kind of flush the floaters out, right? I've got these bodies floating around in the vitreous humor. So I want to do a combination of swinging because that gets the floaters moving around, circulating inside the eye, and sunning and palming, which is going to create that opening up of the drainage canal so that as the floaters are kind of circulating around, there's a chance maybe they'll, you know, cleanse out or we'll get the lymph fluid, the lymph system, which is sort of the cleanup crew of the body in there to help purify the fluids of the eyes. So, yeah, I do think that there um, could be a, a positive effect there. And... On the whole, though, by palming, you are also reducing nearsightedness or farsightedness, which will help with the floaters as well. So instead of just thinking about how do I get rid of these floaters, it's it's more about, well, how do I get rid of the myopia because or presbyopia or hyperopia? Because once that is reduced, you're not even going to see the floaters anymore. So there is this physical aspect where we do want to cleanse the eyes, but there's also a mental aspect where as your vision continues to improve, the floaters, you see right through them, even if they are still there. So definitely uh, 
keep up with some of those good relaxing practices. Oh, nice. Patricia said, thanks so much, Nathan. Your childhood memories elicited some of my own in the 1950s. So that's that was really my goal today, Patricia, was to really um, just kind of walk you through a little bit of, you know, down my memory lane to maybe initiate some activation in your brain of some dormant thought or memory or thing that you haven't thought about in a long time. And that feeling that comes up when you're like, Oh my gosh, I haven't thought about that in so long. There, there's something to that. You know, it's, it's kind of a cool feeling. It's sort of like a fuzzy feeling that comes through. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Rantone said, is it okay to palm with hands cold or does it need to be warm before starting? Um, actually one of my students in, uh, in Seattle recently, actually it, that might be, <laughs> it might be you if that's, if that's running, uh, got a, a portable hand warmer, uh, like a USB charging hand warmer, um, and would hold it like that. And so it gets nice and hot and then put the hand warmer down and go right into palming. And so I actually copied copied him and I, I got one for myself and because I recently moved to Vermont and it's going to be a lot colder up here this winter. And sometimes my hands also get cold. So I've been experimenting with that. I've been using that on my hands and warming up my fingers. And it, it does feel much better to just go right into that warmth versus putting cold hands on. And it will generate heat eventually, but um, I think when you think about palming, it's a combination of the darkness and the heat that we want to, you know, really get that vasodilation and the circulation going. So yeah, you can either get like those hand warmers that you put in your gloves or the one I got online is rechargeable. So it's like more reusable. You can just charge it back up. All right. Samir said during meeting or class or any time when we do not need to see the screen, best time for palming. Yeah. Especially like, you know, I started to do this when watching shows or movies is because I realized I would sort of stare when I would watch things on TV. So I started to either close my eyes or palm my eyes and continue to listen to what was going on on the screen. And instead of just depending on my eyes to show me what was happening, I would actually let my imagination fill in the scene. So I wouldn't be able to see the screen, but I could still hear people talking and I would picture their movements and stuff on the screen. So yeah, that's a great tip too, Samira, in terms of like finding that time during screen time as well. Pira also asked about the floaters. So I already kind of touched on that. Awesome. Hey, Cynthia, uh, lovely autumn Asheville afternoon. I'm Missing Asheville as well, but I have been enjoying Vermont and really been enjoying all the amazing colors and the leaves up here. It's been, been awesome. All right, just scrolling through here. We're just, just over an hour, so probably going to hop off here shortly, but just want to see if there's anything else. Uh, Glenda was asking, can we start your six-month class now? So. I have these two main programs. There's the six month group, which has a start date and an end date. And it's like a live group course. And that one is actually already underway. It's going September to February. So I'll probably start up another one of those in, in the new year. Uh, but in the meantime, there is also another program, the holistic vision program that can, it doesn't have a start or end date. It's it's, and there's not a group with it. So there isn't a live component. It's just, you can, literally start that today if you wanted to and go through it at your own pace. Uh, but there isn't like that sort of uh, group dynamic or the live element of it. Um, but yeah, both of those can be, can be found on my website and I don't have any dates set for the next one uh, for the next six month group, but I'm sure I'll be adding that to my site or, or announcing it here on YouTube. Seal asked, where do I start if I have a small prescription and nearsighted? So definitely, you know, daily implementation of what we did today, doing some palming, some relaxation, some visualization. In terms of your prescription, you could consider using some training glasses. So let's just say I'm pulling a random number out. If you're just minus one, if you have minus one glasses, you could maybe order online minus 0.75 glasses or even 0.5 glasses. So you actually 
decrease the strength a little bit. And when you combine the Bates method relaxation practices with wearing these under corrected training glasses, that tends to take care of it. So that those would be my recommendations would be to really kind of pick up your Bates practice and maybe consider using some training glasses. And I do have a video about, you know, how to get training glasses and how to figure out your prescription and all that. Lucas said, uh, can you reduce myopia while having astigmatism or do you have to remove astigmatism first? I had both and I was working on getting rid of them both at the same time. So there's not really an order to it. You can be working on multiple vision problems at the same time. Um, and oftentimes these vision problems are connected anyway. So it's kind of hard to just get rid of one and not the other. But there are definitely some specific ways to target astigmatism, myopia, cataracts, glaucoma. So it, it like I said before, it's not a cookie cutter approach, but it is all definitely connected and influences each other. Right. Let's see. In phone, high brightness or low brightness. Um, so that it, it's generally good to kind of match your ambient lighting. So if it's really bright out, then you would maybe want to put the screen brightness up. If you're in a dimmer, darker room, you'd probably want to turn it down. Um, so it really is up to your comfort level. Um, some people are more sensitive to this than others. Uh, I'm personally someone who likes to use the night shift mode. Like I have the night shift mode on, on my phone all the time, even though it's not nighttime. So that makes the screen less bright because there's less blue light coming out. So it's just more comfortable on my eyes to use it like that. I also use like the um, dark mode, which inverts the colors as well. That cuts down on the brightness. So I think for the most part, low brightness is, is like a little bit more gentle. But depending on the device, sometimes when you turn the brightness down, it kind of changes the flicker rate of the screen. Like I said, some people are more sensitive to that than others. So it might not be, might, might not be an issue, but on the Iris software that I use, my blue blocking software, there's a brightness bar that makes the screen dimmer without changing the flicker rate. So you can look into that if you want. It's a uh, software called Iris. Gia asked, did your outdoor time increase after your eyesight restored? Um, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I've, it's just always been a goal of mine to, you know, get as much outdoor time as possible. You know, I, that's why I love having my dog. He's, he's a daily excuse for me to get outside, get in the sunlight, get my body moving, breathe that air, um, taking him out on hikes, out in the woods and stuff, going to the dog park. So, um, yeah, he, he's been my, my helpful buddy for that. But I mean, early on in my vision improvement process, I learned that being outside in the sunlight, my vision was much, much better than inside in artificial light. So yeah, I kind of gravitated towards outdoor time uh, for the most part, and it can be really good for your eyes. Nice. Reese was also updating saying he came close to getting laser eye surgery for hyperopia in retrospect. Thankful I didn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was in the same boat. I was really thinking about getting that laser laser eye surgery and, and just so, so grateful that, that the Bates method was came into my, into my orbit before I made that decision. Gia brought up, yeah, all the textures. I always avoid the dirty part of my childhood home, which is the backyard. Always can see cockroach. So that is exactly what I'm talking about. There's certain things that we kind of avoid thinking about. And, and I'm not saying that we need to really kind of like obsess over it, but I, I think you, you did the right thing today by just acknowledging, wow, there's this difference between this part that doesn't have this, you know, negative sort of connotation to it. And then there's this part that, you know, I always see a cockroach and that has this sort of negative connotation to it, kind of aversion to it, but you're, you weren't actually there. Right. And that's the beauty of this, this visualization is you get to realize that now, wherever you are, you're in a different place in your life, probably a different location. And this is just all imaginary and you get to go into the backyard and, and realize that either that cockroach isn't real or 
the cockroach doesn't show up. Maybe you think of something else there instead to kind of almost modify that memory. So, you know, we didn't go too deep into that today, but that's kind of where you can, you can go with this stuff. So thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, cool. Harriet also chimed in and said, I found that CoQ10 got rid of floaters. So yeah, sometimes it is also a nutritional or um, mineral deficiency or, or nutrient kind of imbalance. So yeah, definitely. I've heard good things about that as well as silica, uh, the homeopathic cell salt silica. Uh, one of my students in Asheville took that and floaters went away. Uh, also, sometimes people talk about other types of enzymes, whether from papaya or pineapple. So yeah, you can also look into the dietary connection. Yeah, Adeline, thanks for sharing that um, about having a hemorrhage in one eye, which left like a large floater in the center of one eye. Um, I use my eyes all day other than extra relaxation and palming breaks. Any suggestions? So that one does sound a little bit different or a little unique since it was kind of um, connected with the hemorrhage as opposed to maybe the, the floaters that happen otherwise. Uh, but I would have similar suggestions in terms of the movement practices to get that lymph flow going. And you could even also explore the, the light therapy, whether it's sunning or specific colored lights um, to take in through the eyes. Those types of things can sometimes target those imbalances. Um, but yeah, that, that sounds like a little bit more of a unique case that might require some slightly different approaches. Oh, Tina said something interesting. When I first started palming, I had clearer eyesight after. Lately, I don't notice any difference. This goes to show you how this evolves. So at the beginning, when you first started it, your eyes were like, yes, this is exactly what I need. And they were showing you that by giving you better vision after palming. But now you are ready for something different, right? Now palming isn't enough. So it would be time to try some other Bates practices. Go into the swinging, go into the sunning, play with your eye charts, maybe try some different you know, things that Dr. Bates taught. And, and you're going to kind of unlock this next level. So yeah, it, it, there, there's a progression through these practices where you know, what worked at the beginning might not work in the middle, might not work in the end, or it might come back. Like I had that experience with the swinging at first, it was amazing. And then it wasn't really doing that much. So I kind of just put it on the back burner. And then a couple months later, I brought it back and it felt amazing again. So it, we don't want to, you know, overdo anything, especially if it's not creating results. That's one thing that Dr. Bates said was that if you do a practice and it doesn't lead to a, a change or improvement, doesn't really do any good to keep on trying it because it's not working for you right now. So find what does work and really put your time into that. Yeah. Gun Lapali said, does using phone more time affect the eyes? Yeah. If you've got some bad vision habits, like um, not blinking enough, not looking away into the distance enough, maybe too much blue light coming at you, especially late at night. So yeah, there's a lot of possibility for that, but there are a lot of ways you can, you know, I use screens all day for teaching this stuff online, but it doesn't affect my eyes as much because I've got my window right here. I've got my good vat, my vision habits going. So um, it's not that you're not allowed to use the screens. You just need to learn how to use them with good vision habits. Well, thank you, Gia. I'm still, uh, figuring out the whole layout here of the new space, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun to kind of put things together and, and start building the table behind me. And uh, yeah, I just got this light yesterday. Uh, not only is it like mesmerizing to look at, but it is meant to actually help create more of that peripheral movement stimulation that somebody brought up. I think uh, Reese was bringing up earlier about this movement in the periphery, how important that is. So if you're looking at me and with your central vision, then your rods and your periphery can be seeing the lights moving in the background too. So uh, probably going to be adding in even more little moving things in the background to help with that. Gabby said, does palming help to improve also the weak eye, which has higher diopters or what do you recommend to help the weaker eye? Yeah. Yeah. It really can. 
but to get more specific in terms of balancing the two eyes, I would encourage you to look into what's called fusion. So fusion, it, it's your teamwork between your left eye and your right eye. A lot of people actually have a dominant eye and a weaker eye and fusion. Uh, the fusion practices are designed to really deal with that and help the eyes come closer into balance together. So there are some vision tools like the Brock string or different kinds of patching and things that um, can really harmonize the two sides. Um, and that's a big part of what I teach um, in my vision training in three phases. We've got relaxation and, as the first phase, fusion is the second phase, and then vision building is the third phase where we do the eye charts. So you might be able to find some stuff online or a really great starting point is to listen to Dr. Sue Barry's TED talk called Fixing My Gaze. It's on YouTube. If you just search for Fixing My Gaze on YouTube, uh, it'll pull up Dr. Sue Barry's TED talk and the little picture of people doing the Brock string. And, uh, and she explains how she got her amblyopic eye to turn back on with the help of the vision therapy. So that might point you in the right direction there. I like that feedback, Harriet, uh, that it's much easier remembering than imagining. And I love how just by changing the word, you know, it can actually make it feel easier because it's, they're very similar, the memory and the imagination, but I totally hear what you're saying that imagination sometimes can feel a little more daunting or like we just have to do more. Whereas remembering it's like, oh yeah, I've got that memory. I'll just pull it out of the memory bank and kind of play with that. Kind of takes some of the pressure off of like having to see something. So uh, yeah, appreciate that distinction there. <laughs> hey, Ronan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just asking whether cold hands was a sign of energy not flowing naturally to my hands or some sort of blockage. It is a little tricky with palming because we do have our, our hands at this angle here, you know, so it, it could be constricting the flow a little bit when we're in that position. Um, but I just know that I also have low thyroid. And so that generally results in like colder limbs and, and appendages and stuff. So, um, yeah, it could be maybe a sign of some other like thyroid, you know, thing or, or some, some other thing going on. Um, but I've been loving using that hand warmer. So I just wanted to thank you for giving me that tip. <laughs> oh yeah. Reese, Reese is also saying that paying attention to your sense of hearing also helps with vision just being present and calm, being in a meditative state. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All the senses are so connected. And I think when we are dealing with vision problems, we're putting even more pressure on our eyes. So if we can take the pressure off our eyes and just say, Oh, well, what am I hearing right now? Or what am I smelling or tasting or feeling? And, and even bringing that into the visualization can be ultra powerful. And, and while your mind is off of your eyes and you're paying attention to your hearing, it's almost like your eyes start to heal and to work better uh, when you're not putting so much pressure on them. Uh, now that I have been given a prescription lens fitted in my eye, will the exercises affect my vision? Oh, so like, yeah, if you have the cataract surgery, it sort of has a, a prescription in the eye there in the lens. Uh, once again, similar kind of answer here where... Um, the Bates method doesn't just work with the lens. It's working with the whole eye organ and the whole visual processing system. So you have abilities to compensate, even if there is has been this prescription lens fitted in the eye. You've got these other muscles and you've got this brain to help navigate this process as your vision does change. So, yeah, it'll definitely be different than not having the surgery, but it, it's totally still possible Yeah, Bethany also sharing about just the role of diet, nutrition, avoiding junk food, you know, too much sugar. It's a good <laughs> good day to bring that up on Halloween when uh, people are probably going to be hitting some sugar spikes tonight. Hey, thanks for tuning in from Austria. Thanks for staying up a little bit later into the evening. Glad you could join us. Oh, Adeline's saying my book is great. There it is back there on the... Looks like it's backwards, though. <laughs> uh, Lucas said, are there Bates techniques that you can do all the time throughout the day? Absolutely. That's what the Bates method is all about. It's not just about palming for 10 minutes and then forgetting about it and going on with your day. 
It's about how do I carry these good vision habits through my computer time while I'm driving, while I'm talking. It's literally meant to totally transform your entire life. And so one example of that is central fixation. Central fixation is something that you need to be doing. You know, it's not really something you do. It's just the way you see. But it is this new phenomenon that you get to pay attention to literally all the time, whether you're looking near, looking far, looking at a screen, looking at someone's face. You know, it, it's really this fundamental principle of the Bates method that not everybody knows about. So I would kind of leave it at that for today and invite you to look into central fixation. And I've got some videos on that that will kind of go deeper into that whole thing and how that can actually carry all throughout the whole day and night. But other examples would be the swing. There's ways we can swing throughout the day. This general dynamic relaxation, just keeping the eyes relaxed all day, blinking, all of these things, shifting. It's like, yeah, it, it, it's really an all day kind of thing, not just like a little exercise routine. Uh, yeah. And um, MV21, it is true that if you stick with this stuff, you can get to the point where you can actually see clearly without needing glasses. That's what I did. And, and that's what I help people do. So whether you go all the way to no glasses or even just going down to lower strength glasses, I think it's really smart to just start a self-care routine for your eyes. Like you might do with your teeth already brushing and flossing your teeth. You know, why not give, give your eyes some love too. Hey Sue, hope you're doing well up there in Pacific Northwest. I haven't been wearing glasses since April, but I get discouraged that I still can't read without my pinholes. But this session has made me feel encouraged to continue my practices of the Bates method. Definitely, it, it requires patience. And it also, like we talked about the training glasses, it might not just be about the cold turkey approach of just no glasses at all since April. You know, there might be some situations where putting glasses on actually helps progress you to the next level of improvement, uh, specifically if you're using the right kind of undercorrected training glasses. So that would depend on what your starting prescription was and everything like that. But I know some people don't like to hear that because they've been really taking Bates's advice and going without them as much as possible. And, and that's what I did, too. But. I also used my glasses whenever I needed them throughout my entire vision improvement process until I didn't need them anymore. So that can actually be sometimes a helpful thing. Um, but um, it's good to hear that you've got the pinholes as another op another option and alternative instead of wearing the training glasses. But um, yeah, just wanted to bring that up because it may actually be helpful to bring that into your routine. Because sometimes I've seen people go without glasses and it, they're holding themselves back. It's like they get a little stuck in that blur. So we need the artificial clarity sometimes to actually help us get through the blur. Oh, uh, hello, Lucian Philippe. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since our uh, our meeting there in London on the Vision Walk. Really, really good memories there. I think back in 2017. It was kind of uh, that was the last one of the of the tour there, and it's starting to get a little chilly by the end of it. But uh, really glad you could be here and and tuning in. All right, so yeah, that's gonna go ahead and do it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that suggestion about doing these more regularly, and I will definitely announce as we uh, maybe we'll get some more in by the end of the year. Otherwise, just. Stay tuned. I'll be continuing to put out videos, uh, you know, interviewing people, doing podcasts. So definitely subscribe to this YouTube channel for more videos or check out the Naked Eye podcast for the Better Eyesight podcast. We also have a couple cool events coming up in November and December um, with the Color Lights World Project. We just had another color week where we got to experience different colors on different days of the week. We're having a couple panel discussions. So I'm, I'm going to be on the last panel in December. Um, but yeah, I'll be adding information about that to my website so you can uh, learn more. It, it, they're going to be these kind of cool discussions about color and light therapy and its effect on our health and wellness and everything. So I'm pretty fascinated by that topic since 
that's really what vision is, is it's taking in light and color in into the body through the eyes and what that could mean for us. So stay tuned for lots of cool more things coming up. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Halloween and I'll look forward to catching you in our next palming party. Stay relaxed and I'll see you next time. <laughs>